Hello and welcome to this week's Health Tech Hour with me, Steve Roost. Each week we bring you the best news, views and interviews with the leaders, CEOs, clinicians and founders who are changing the face of healthcare in the UK and beyond. As regular listeners will know, I am the CEO and founder of a health tech venture myself called PocDoc. PocDoc has a mission to make access to make universal to, to bring universal access to cardio, metabolic and renal screening in the UK and the wider world. And we are starting that with our healthy heart checks. So if you do want to get a healthy heart check, which is the equivalent of an NHS cardiovascular screening in your own home, you can head to pocdoc.co right now. That's P-O-C-D-O-C dot co. Go have a look. We're working across the NHS and across community pharmacy across the UK. And thank you very much, obviously, to PocDoc for supporting the show. Finally, um, thanks to everyone listening. So that's listening live. Uh, we get, obviously, we thank very much the UK Health Radio for being our live partner, giving us this opportunity. Johan and his team are doing a fantastic job. And we also thank anyone who's listening on demand on any of the podcast channels. So that's across all of the normal ones, the main ones, um, as well as YouTube. This goes out on YouTube after the fact. And also we're building up our Instagram presence, either with myself, which is at Steve Roost, or at Health Tech Hour. So you can catch us through our own channels, but you can also catch us on the UK Health Radio channels. And what I would also say is that please have a look at all of the other content on UK Health Radio. There's lots of other presenters on here doing amazing work, and I would recommend that you take a look at what they're doing. We've been on a fantastic run of shows at the moment. For anyone who missed last week's show with Peter and Craig, it really was an amazing show. Those two individuals, Peter and Craig, are what well, I described it as thriving with terminal cancer. They're both stage four terminal cancer patients who have dedicated the time that they have remaining living between three monthly scans to getting as much out of their life in terms of positivity and being a force for good for their friends and their family and other sufferers of cancer. They both have a health technology background, which is why they were on the show. And I, I really recommend if you want to if you want to listen to an inspiring show this year, I would I would recommend that one. Um, two fantastic examples of post-traumatic growth. And the show really turned into a kind of a real world study, if you like, of post-traumatic growth. That one's available, as I said, across all of the podcast channels or on YouTube, or we've sliced and diced it a bit on the Instagram channels. So on to today's show, um, we are going to go to a completely different uh, sector and a completely different topic today from um, terminal cancer survival. Um, and we are going to be talking, we're going to go back to kind of the core of the show, really, which is the technology side of things, the tech stuff, um, and do a deep dive into open source healthcare solutions and healthcare IT. Healthcare system, I'm pretty sure everyone understands, runs on IT. And IT really is the, you know, it, it can go really well or it can go really badly. And being good at that bit of it can make a huge difference to patients' lives, their health outcomes, their satisfaction the insatisfaction of all of our wonderful healthcare workers and staff and clinicians where there's huge pressure um, that, that's currently being seen across the system about people leaving. And so all of the satisfaction and reducing friction and making their lives easier, a lot of that circles around this issue of, of, of technology, of IT. So to help me through this and get through this, this show and really dig into the important stuff, I've got two fantastic individuals. I've got Richard Pugmire, CEO of Answer Digital, which is a leading healthcare IT solutions provider based in the North. They've recently won a number of awards in the North, uh, the North of England. And Joel Ratnasothi, CEO of Interneuron, who has pioneered uh, open source medical records. Um, Joel, Richard, welcome to the show. How are you? All good. Thanks, Steve. Very good. Great to be here. Great. Perfect. So when we have two people on the show, we have to do a bit of a dance and kind of bounce between people a little bit. But so why don't we, what I'd like to do is just try and set the scene a little bit for everyone listening, because we're a bit of a broad church. We've got lots of different types of listeners. Um, why don't we start with you, Richard? In your view, why is, why is this area of IT um, technology open source why do you think it's so important to talk about and, and for people listening to understand a bit about it yeah it's a, it's a great question i mean we um 
uh, we'll probably get into you know the, the solutions and why open source solutions are a little bit different, I guess, for healthcare. But but ultimately, it's about kind of um, doing tech for good. And and you know, my background is a very technical one. Uh, uh, I, I guess there are lots of uh, experiences over the last twenty years that I've been working in the NHS and with the NHS uh, on technical solutions. And ultimately, what we kind of see time and time again is kind of almost missed opportunities for the NHS in particular, who are in a very unique position globally to kind of own a bit of its own intellectual property or its own software solutions. Um, and, and I think that there is space for that to be done slightly differently, not necessarily everywhere, not in all uh, sectors of healthcare. You know, there are, there are great reasons to go with big enterprise solutions for certain scenarios and certain uh, environments. But you know, uh, not just purely open source, but the, the 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 kind of ethics and the thought process behind open source allows a, a level of kind of shared ownership and, and, and realization of benefit that doesn't come with strings attached and kind of almost gives you a, a freedom for uh, setting your own destiny on where you're going to go next. That's a very great summary. I'm not sure if you prepared that, but that was excellent. Nope. <laughs> um, Joel, no, no, Joel, no pressure. Why don't you kind of try and take the same thing and try and well, let's set the scene a little bit here about why this, this, I know that you've got some fantastic solutions, particularly in the open source medical record space, your, your, your MCR product, which we can definitely get into. But um, why don't we, why don't you try and set the scene a bit as it was, why is this so important? Like why should people care at a punter level, if you like? Yeah. I'm, you know, just to follow on from Rich was saying, the, Technology is really good. It's really very important for for the NHS and for healthcare in general. Our data that we're that we that we're generating vast amounts of is going to be increasingly valuable. Everybody sort of knows this. Uh, at the moment, it, the NHS is very much bending over backwards to use technology in the way that it's been built by technology providers. And um, what we really need is technology to be able to be more co-designed with the NHS for the NHS to really enable good practice as the NHS sees it. And, and that's really the, the, the I'd say the the, um, the point that's worth making. Technology needs to be flexible to a changing NHS, rather than the NHS always trying to work in, ever increasingly harder to, to to change its ways of working to meet you know standard standard products that may not have been built you know in this geography in this in this healthcare environment. You know, flexibility, adaptability. The future is one where technology is assisting the innovative ways of working rather than trying to adopt innovative technologies just for its own sake. That all makes a lot of sense. And so I don't know whether anyone listening is going to feel the same way as I feel, but I sort of, um, listening to both of you, that sort of just strikes me as kind of common sense. So, so is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, obviously there's a balance, right? I mean, it's, I mean, maybe because I'm a health tech entrepreneur myself and in digital health and technology, and maybe I'm slightly higher up the curve, you know, I don't know, but, but is, is, is it, you know, how bad is it? If, if you like, if, if what mm. you're saying there is seen to be revolutionary when maybe one could argue it should be common sense. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm happy to jump in first. I'm sure Joe will, will add some reflections, but, um, I mean, you could take you could take a, a very exciting field, uh, AI, for example. I've uh, heard of it. It's a yeah. thing. I've yeah, heard of it. Everyone's talking about it. It has uh, significant promise to deliver <laughs> uh, improvements in a whole bunch of areas of, of healthcare, but there are a lot of risks associated with it, and there are a lot of kind of ethical and moral questions. But ultimately, you have a, a, a green field of technology there that. We almost have the opportunity to learn the lessons of what's gone before, in certainly in the NHS, with with regard to kind of new platforms and new technology. And and so, if you uh, kind of just allow the de facto uh, um, status quo to happen, then a, a couple of big vendors will come along. They will do exactly what you'd expect. They try to capture the market as quickly as possible uh, and kind of lock people into their way of way of kind of working that's happened in primary care it's happened in secondary care mental health and you end up with a dilution of innov you know innovation and, and sort of a restriction on what you can and can't benefit from as the nhs that's a prime example example of what we're talking about where you can do things differently so if you were to take a more kind of open source or certainly you know uh, ownership of uh the, the 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 new green field platform of say ai and mm -hmm 
the NHS kind of held the reins to that, then you're in command of who can and can't come and play with the data that you're potentially opening up and, and the improvements that you're going to make in, in pathways by giving access to that data. But you're also kind of stopping anyone else from restricting you. So, you know, say over in Australia or in, in Germany or wherever, they come up with a new amazing machine learning model and it doesn't work with your current platform today, well, you're going to be kind of locked out. And, and that, you know, is an example of where if the NHS kind of got its its thinking together at a, at a more kind of infrastructure level and saw platforms in this way, it might be able to safeguard itself from ending up in a, you know, duopoly or, or, or otherwise where you end up in the sort of Spotify, Netflix, you know, Amazon Prime kind of, well, if you want to watch that TV series, you've got to get a different subscription type model that we find ourselves in today. Mm. Joel, what's your take on it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's no monopoly because it's not one industry. You know, every, everyone thinks they understand healthcare. I, I started my career as a medical doctor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I had some very strong views of, on, on how tech should work. I've been humbled uh, by the process of going to different hospitals and building software. Um, and everyone has a personal experience of healthcare and they think they get it. But in reality, you know, ENT has as much in common with Ops and Gynae as the retail industry has with with the airline industry, you know, they're similar. You can, you can generally make parallels between them, uh, but they're different. The process is different. The standards are different. The workflows are different, importantly different. So you need to be able to adapt what you've got. Yes, there's a common core. There is a common consensus around what is medicine and what isn't medicine. Uh, there are some common themes and elements. But you, if you go in with one a one-size-fits-all monopoly type approach to, to AI or, or any other field of, of, of healthcare technology, you, you're, going, you're going to fail. Uh, and so yeah, adaptability, flexibility, that's what's key. Um, and I think technology is very much led, been technology-led. We need to be more process, user experience, customer-led. And was, was it that, well, sorry, and it, the creation of NHSX, which I think is now gone i'm not sure um and the, but the nhs digital is still there um was was that gone too is that josh richard shaking his head so w was, were, they, were those two entities created to sort of address what you're saying and now they've been moved on elsewhere or were they not created for that purpose at all of something else i know they took on a life of their own during covid that was their that was their moment but uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, there's there's a lot there's a lot of politics to to talk about, I guess, and there's a lot of kind of difficult areas there, grey areas. But you know, I, I think if you if you if you heard about NHSX when they were being set up, it was almost supposed to be that um, uh, uh, skunk work style innovation area where things could just be done and you would get stuff done, right? Um, mm. Uh, and, and that really kind of lent, lent itself very well into the world of rapid response to COVID. And, and you know, they had great success with uh, working with multiple organizations, MOD, Test and Trace, NHS Digital, et cetera, to pull them together and build, uh, you know, the, like, for example, the COVID pass, which we uh, were pretty involved with. So we got an opportunity to see innovation through NHSX there in a, in a, in a different light. And it really did cut a lot of the red tape that you would have otherwise would have felt uh, if that had been a standard program, I guess. And part of that, I'm sure, was the the environment of COVID and the, and the kind of demands on the on the team to pull that together. But uh, you know, part of it, you know, would it have been the same if it was run as a typical NHS project at a national level? I'm not sure it would have. Um, but obviously, the, you know, I guess the, the current day, even Steve, you're struggling to keep up yourself. You know, everyone's now back in NHS England. There's lots of um, I guess kind of reshuffling going on and, and reorganization, which can frustrate us all as as uh, as as users of the service and, and, and funders in through taxes, et cetera, to see where they're gonna go next. But I think, you know, they, they still have that important mandate. They do have that that kind of responsibility to set technology goals and, and, and vision and, and be a supporting entity for the NHS at a national level. And I think they will, you know, develop back into that very quickly. Yeah, and, and, and innovation, at least my, my, my interpretation of that is it's not a top-down approach. You, you can't, you know, centralise innovation and expect that to dis distribute. You've got to create the enabling platforms, technologies, culture uh, to allow local hospitals, local healthcare providers 
to innovate themselves, you know, and, and they, they know they need to do that around the clinical services they provide. It's not that much of a step forward beyond that to be innovating around the technologies to help them do that. And, uh, it, you know, central bodies should, should be enablers for local technical implementations, yeah. technical innovation. Yeah. I would agree with that. I, th I think, you know, you hear about certain programs happening and, and initiatives where, you know, the central teams go out and they work in trusts and, and they get close to the front line. And, it, and it's things like that that will help them kind of find their North Star and, and, and align with what the service needs. Because, you know, somebody that's been in the NHS, you know, uh, in the secondary care world for 10 years before leaving, you know, you, you really do become uh, kind of removed from that it, unintentionally over time. You kind of, uh, and, and and so it, it, you know, it really, you do need reminded often, uh, little and often in, in many cases, uh, to be a good uh, innovator and, and, and how to support that local innovation happening. And how much, how much of that um, innovation in your areas do you think at a local level or regional level um, has to come from a culture change as opposed to other forces of change, be they clinical or financial or, you know, and how, but like, I, the reason I'm asking is a couple of shows ago, we had um, Liam Cahill on, who's a reasonably a pretty well-known sort of um, uh, technologist specializing in the NHS and NHS systems, specifically in innovation. So, and, and his, one of his theses was, was that the culture in the NHS doesn't encourage innovation because it's people are scared of making mistakes and scared about being kind of chewed out or worse if they do something and particularly around patient data is it i can imagine that's quite a scary area to feel like you're testing things in i suspect yeah, I mean, I think you've summed that up quite well. There's definitely, I think the culture of the NHS is good in terms that people will go the extra mile to do what's right for, for patients and their families. So there's the intent that's definitely there. And that's, you know, that's a very valuable asset. But, you know, I think it, 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 it would be fair to say that, um, you know, if you stick your head, your neck far too out from the from the main line, that someone's going to, somebody's going to, um, uh, um, to be swinging axes, so your 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 a culture of fear is definitely is definitely a problem. If if what you want to do is encourage innovation, and, and you know you, we, we need to have a safe space for allow people to make mistakes. You know, a, a sort of sandpit playground areas for those types of things, which which we don't really have. Yeah, you, you mentioned you know at the top of the show we talked about open source. That that itself you know is a is a is a big risk. It can be seen as a big risk as a, as a CFO or a CEO of a of a trust. You know why why do you want to trust some software that's you know been uh, open sourced on the internet and other people can see the source code? Well, you know it, it's a difficult argument to have sometimes because they want a, a trusted brand, they want a, a, a product they can recognize. But if you can convince people that 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 culture of of, of uh, change is enabled by open source, and and that actually there are lots of other benefits behind that, then you can win. But it is a difficult one. You know, you really do have to find a couple of uh, you know very senior people in an organisation that will put their neck on the line to to reap those benefits. And so, what what let's let's get into that. We'll we'll, we'll get into it a little bit. Then we'll stop for a break. Then we'll come back to it because I think this is a really interesting area that I want to kind of talk about and get out there for everybody. So wh why traditionally is open source seen as quote unquote risky, whereas I don't know what the technical name for the opposite of open source is, but, but whatever the open enterprise, I'm not sure, whereas that's more safe because I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it like that. And that's an open question to, to either one of you. Joel, do you want to go first? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, the reality is it's branding. Um, the, if you look at security in terms of software, um, open source is now sort of demonstrably safer than the many clo closed source would be the opposite phrase um, systems. Um, there's now a, a, a new standard um, called OpenChain, which is where you know, vendors are, are being asked to provide a, a software bill of materials. Can you provide a bit of materials for all of the components that have been used in your product? Many closed source um, solutions utilize open source software. You know, you, you're right. just not, they just, they just don't necessarily need to share. So the, the, the real, the real, the proof of the pudding is around, is around the security on, on known vulnerabilities in your, in your product. Uh, transparent, sunshine is the best disinfectant when it comes to security and being able to develop in such a way that other people can point out the mistakes that you've made 
uh, and they get corrected quickly is definitely the best way of, of ensuring uh, a culture and a process of, of long-term security. Um, quite why that doesn't filter through, through the industry, I, I, I can, you know, I, I has to say it's, it's better marketing. I don't know, Rich, what you think. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think branding's part of it. I, I think it's just more complicated. You know, so somebody has to go on a short learning curve to understand that the risk isn't a real, you know, a, a, a thing that's going to kind of sideswipe you later, later down the line. But, you know, in that in that kind of old school world of, of you know, nobody's ever been fired for hiring X or buying yeah. Y, you know, you, you do you do have a bigger fight on your hands if you want to convince somebody of something that's slightly different and doesn't look like the norm. Um, despite the fact that it could perform the same, if not better, be, you know, potentially more affordable, have other innovation kind of opportunities for others to collaborate, et cetera. And, and that complexity, I think, you know, it, it does just make it more difficult to buy in what is already a very difficult to, you know, sell to, if you like, uh, market in, in the public sector. Yeah, because you've got quite a few, um, we'll dig into it a bit more about your specific solutions because in this space, particularly in the UK, it's dominated by a very small number of large enterprise businesses in different areas, whether it's primary care, you know, with the with the players that we have there um, or, or, or anything else. Um, so presumably, although I don't know because I've not been any of those pitches or seen any of their pitching documents, presumably those guys sort of pitch against this idea of open source as being you know, I don't know, dangerous or whatever it is. In some, despite the fact they may have open source elements in their software, like you said, Joel. Yeah, I mean, there are so many different drivers for why you know large organisations make the purchasing decisions that they do. Uh, some of them are, 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 um, are about you know, no one has got fired for buying X or Y, so fear, if you like, you know, fear of fear of making a mistake and safety in numbers. So if you go with the the bigger organisation, they've got more. Um, backing if you like to support you if things go wrong so there's that there's that sense um but then i think there's also political reasons so there's 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 this idea that um there exists off the shelf products that can do everything you like the private sector has solved this um years ago we just need to look to other geographies to go go and go and bring those in and that's just generally a myth you know anybody that looks at yeah. any of the software out there there's, there's plenty of white spaces um in in the product gaps so for for those general reasons and the fact, and from my personal view is, the, in, a, in a scenario where the buyer is not the user, you get these disconnects. So if that's I'm the person, point. that's a great right? point. Right. So if you if you if you go to the app store, um, let's take the Apple App Store, and you go there and you say, well, "Where are the bad apps?" You can't see them because they're all at the bottom. It's a very right. democratic process. All the good ones get go straight to the top. Whereas in a B two B world, business to business world. Uh, where the person who's buying doesn't want to make a mistake, very worried about price, um, maybe pressure to buy an off-the-shelf product from another jurisdiction because you know it's shovel ready and there are political pressures from on high. Uh, you're going to you, you end up with a very different market, uh, and it's it's it's. It, it, I, I think the state of the current market globally, uh, this isn't peculiar to the UK. I think it is a reflection of those kinds of those kinds of incentives. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll take a two-minute break and then. We'll come back again because I want to dig into, I want to put it on its head and let's talk about the real value of why open source should be the future of, of healthcare software development, healthcare IT development, and then your specific solutions because they're very interesting and, and very exciting. So we'll be back after two minute break with my, my guests today, uh, Richard and Joel from Interneuron and Answer Digital in reverse order. We'll be back in two minutes. Hello and welcome back to this week's show with myself, Steve Roost, and my guests today, Richard and Joel, and we're digging into the um, whole area of open source software in healthcare and, and IT. So um, before the break, we talked a little bit about some of the uh, undeserved things that have been said and some of the myths in around this space. Let's dive into the reasons why and the real value of this and open source. So maybe we can start with Joel and you can try and talk about your own history of of uh, moving as medical doctor into this area and what interneuron does to really try and kind of communicate the benefits of this different approach versus what the, the standard enterprise model is, is, is happening. And then we can bring Richard in on that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, I started my career as a, as a, as a junior doctor um, in London back in, I think I ended up in 2001, quite a while ago. Uh, and, you know, sp spent, 
many a year doing uh, jobbing uh, junior doctor uh, before realizing that um, there's a lot wrong with the system um, and the systems that we were using that were frustrating you know my clinical practice uh, and actually I'd much rather fix the system than continue to fight for it, fight it from within uh, and so um, kind of very long story short made the made the transition away from from the NHS and into industry I worked for some large companies before founding into neuron about six years ago now into neuron's been set up to solve um, some some of the, the, the sort of thornier problems. We've got an open modular care record. I can talk more about that later. But the, the 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 value in what we've built is there are certain the modular nature of what we've built. We've built certain solutions. Um, how you find a patient, we've built that once. How you how you log on, we've built that once. How you integrate with certain systems, we've built that once. The value of open source software um, has been you know demonstrated in every other industry. Uh, the, the the industry they don't they don't demand this as a standard they evolve a standard you know and the market winner evolves that standard so it's a very bottom up democratic approach and these standard technologies that have, that that, have, that evolve up are the ones that get used and reused and in doing so I can worry about building an electronic prescribing solution uh, and um, and how how nurses should should administer these drugs on on a busy ward round and not be worried about um, you know which particular framework I should be using, or which particular technology I should be using, and then the community all benefits from that from that platform, which we all build on, and then you get real innovation, uh, rather than everybody going down to the bottom of the technology stack and trying to build it all for, all, all from the bottom up the, up themselves. So that, in a in a nutshell, I think is is the real value of open source. And you know, open source software is running this call almost certainly. It's running our phones. It's running the internet. You know, this isn't a radical idea. This isn't, yeah. this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, particularly shocking. It's just that this is the approach. And we want to move the conversation away from technology onto real clinical problems, real innovation. Like how do we, how do we you know, tr um, use our technology to change the locations of care, so to, to move towards preventative care? Those are where the conversation should be. Um, and so open source, it's just, a cult it's just a cultural practice that allows acceleration of innovation. And why does it allow it to move? Quick? Why why does it inherently allow things to move more quickly? Because you've got a you've got a community that's working together, yeah, and they're not working together because they they're particularly cooperative. They're, they're competing, but they all benefit. We all benefit when somebody creates a new technology to manage databases. Uh, we, we all benefit, uh, and then if I see if if I find an error in the software I'm using, I'll fix it and share that share that share that fix with the community. Everybody benefits. But you're, are you obligated to are you obligated to do that, or is it? How does that work? So, get a little bit complicated now. So, Sorry, well, look, yes. we got we got we got no, twenty eight minutes. Well, yeah. Joel, you know okay, what I mean? so Let's so, so there, there there are different licensing models for open source. So open source in general means I'm going to publish my code. There's what okay. there's there's something called a hard license, which is what we use. Which is if you take our software and change it. You are obligated. It's a license. We are licensing our software, and the license obliges you to publish the changes you've made. Okay. So if you take my software, you can use it. That's great. But if, but if you if you see a problem or if you enhance it, you've got to publish those changes. And then there are softer permissive licenses um, um, where you can take the code, do what you like. You don't need to tell it. You, you know, you need to show some accreditation attribution, but you don't need to. Um, you don't need to share those changes. And so that permissive license is often used in, in, in what you might call enterprise closed source products. It's still open source. They're still taking the code from elsewhere. Um, but the harder licenses is the world that you know, I'd like to see in healthcare particularly, where, you know, particularly when we've got public money being used to develop public money, public code. We, we develop a library. Yeah, I, think, and, I, I think that's a really I think that's a really interesting and compelling argument in this space, which is there's billions of pounds being provided by the government to solve these issues to IT technology providers. And where, where, what equity is that bill being, what, who, what, what equity is that creating in UK PLC, in the NHS? Where does that equity value get moved to? I think that's a really compelling, a really compelling argument. Yeah, it, it, it's not even just the pound note value, Steve. If, if, if you need clinical time uh, away from, from patients to develop good software, which is the kind of mantra that Joel and I kind of sign up to, you want to do that as few times as possible. And it's not just about open sourcing the software that you've built. It's the, the patterns and the understanding of how to solve a problem um, that, that can also benefit from the, the, the same kind of approach, right? So 
you know, I get that, you know, the, the, the counter argument to open source, uh, you know, you, you might hear things like, you know, how do, how do I generate my own IP? But to your point, it's not your IP, it's the NHS's IP. You know, we yeah. put doctors and nurses time into it, we put patient engagement into it, we put, you know, trials and software testing, et cetera, into it. You know, there is a real good argument that a lot, a lot of what is built you know, it is is has been massively contributed to by the NHS. Well, and also, like, I feel like the NHS at some point needs to. Might I'd be really surprised if this isn't in the contract, but but it might not because there's a difference between grants and commercial contracts sometimes. But that they would have a co ownership of any arising IP, right? like or or some. I mean, I don't know how much IP really arises in an IT most, connectivity. Most, I, most, I, 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 you know, I think most hospitals don't. You know, some of them yeah. might be interested, but most of them are, are not interested because that's I, not their job. You know, there's, 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 definitely, <laughs> there's definitely, a, you know, the idea that we should back ourselves a little bit more uh, and have to have the ability to, to, to do this at a local level, I think, you know, should be supported. The, the trouble is that, that, you know, history is littered with national programs that didn't quite work. Yeah. Uh, for, for British understatement. But the, yeah. um, but that, that, because of that, you know, no, the, the polit- we come back to the political risk. So again, fear of fear of failure. So we've now got to a point though where a single EPR could cost you hundreds of millions of pounds. Someone really does have to look in there and say, you know, we have the talent, we have the skills, we have the we have we have the capability. For hundreds of millions of pounds, are we really just going to throw that money um, and buy a off the shelf product? Um, or should we be investing in some technology that gets that gets used and reused? And, yeah. Um, I, so let so let's dig into some examples from either or well from both of you around how this has been really successful. Obviously, Interneuron's got some great examples with with the MCR record. Um, but I, I, Richard, I don't know if you've got any others. So sure. I think let's try and be great if we could bring this to life a little bit. And you know, why is this the best thing, and what have we seen that's really yeah. worked? Yeah, I, I, happy to jump in first. So so. Um, Again, in that space of, of artificial intelligence, right? Um, uh, Nvidia are probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, company now, uh, yeah. and, and that's on the rise of them selling the hardware that sits under all of the AI that we're all kind of, you know, using at the moment to do lots of interesting things with ChatGPT, etc. Um, but they have a huge R and R and D department, and w- as part of the life sciences program of Nvidia, they've invested tens, if not hundreds, of millions of dollars into an open source uh, initiative called Monai. Uh, you can Google it, you can find out a bit about it, but essentially it's a framework of reusable open source uh, componentry that makes essentially the process of interacting with uh, expensive GPUs and, and, and clinical data and all the parts and pieces that, of the jigsaw that, that help you solve AI problems. And they, they kind of open source that and they worked you know, globally uh, with Mayo Clinic and others, you know, on uh, developing that. When we were working with our one of our customers on on uh, an Innovate UK granted uh, initiative to essentially build a, a UK uh, platform for, for AI um, that I was kind of talking a little bit about earlier, the first, you know, the first place we looked was what else is out there because you don't want to be starting from scratch. And you know what we did? We contributed back to that. We're now kind of, you know, seeing ourselves as global leaders in because we've contributed back, added to the global kind of IP, if you like, that's that, that's built there and, and progressed uh, the, the mission of creating a, a useful frame framework and toolkit for for uh, model developers or whatever it might be, the, the, the ecosystem that sits around this burgeoning and, and green field. Um, uh, and, and so it's standardized a lot. It's we've, we've reap the benefit of what they've done, but we've also contributed back. But it hasn't stopped the NHS innovating, and it hasn't stopped us as a private entity uh, innovating alongside them. We can build sort of parts of that that we might not want to fully open source. We might want to have a you know shared IP arrangement with the NHS to you know because actually as as the NHS we have a very unique healthcare system globally, and it allows us to you know give back to UK PLC by developing IP that that you know only only we can. So you know, we found that hugely successful. We we got a great head start um, from from work that was done globally, uh, and and the NHS benefit from that. And we gave a little bit back so that everyone else also felt the benefit of the NHS being on board. Okay, and um, Joel, let's maybe like see where you want to take that question. 
Well, no, just, just to echo the, the point, it's the foundations that, that we're, we're, we're talking about here. It's the, it's the fundamentals. And, and, you know, you said earlier, Steve, that this is, this, isn't this obvious? You know, it's, 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 it's obvious, but it's, it's not easy. You know, so we're built with, we're, we're, we're going through this transition where we're moving towards these digital records. You know, what we need to get done now isn't, isn't, even, isn't even innovation. We just need to get ubiquitously across the NHS a fundamental baseline of medical records uh, from, from, you know, operating system, server infrastructure, all the way through to basic medical records. And then, then we're innovating, you know, let's, it's the use cases that we build on top of that get exciting. You know, I don't want to be talking about um, platforms and technology and, um, you know, uh, the smarts that they're under the hood. I want to be talking about how we've, you know, reduced medical er errors in a, in, in, in a hospital from, from, our, from our prescribing software or, you know, how we're going to go on and, and change um, uh, a healthcare system so we, we move to a more preventative world, you know, uh, mm. so we're not having to wait for things to go wrong. That's the world everybody wants to go to. And until we solve the, the big um uh, sort of foundational problem, which is open source lends itself to perfectly. Nobody wants to be building this again and again. You know, some of this is hard. It's it's not it's not complicated. Everyone, I, I, you know, to your earlier point, Steve, it's not. This isn't this. You could get a million, hundred people in a room around the NHS. There'll all be in violent agreement at the end. It's right. just, it's just qu quite painful to go through that process and do it. So, as Rich was saying, let's do it once. If we did it once and we open source that technology and it was there. Odds on, no one's going to take it as is, but they could modify it for their local, for themselves. You see, the, the delta between what exists and where you need to get to just gets smaller and smaller. Uh, you know, we, we start to develop a culture that's, you know, where that's just the norm, uh, and we can move on because, you know, yeah, you, Rich is talking about AI. You know, we still have a, 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 a paper problem in the NHS. You can't build AI on paper records. No, I, I'm sure that might be quite hard. Um, so we're going to go for our final commercial break now. And then on, when we get back, I, I, I want to go into the details around some of the interneuron products and maybe some of the projects answers done that really try and, um, like you said, Joel, like talking about building the platform is a bit esoteric, I think, for people. I think let's try and like let's get specific and how could this help or, or how has this helped or i think that would that would be great after the break so we'll be back in two minutes with richard from arts digital and joel ceo of interneuron um and obviously myself steve roost host of the health tech hour we'll be right back hello and welcome back to the final part of this week's health tech hour with me steve roost and my guests this week richard pugmire the ceo of answer digital and joel ratnasothi who is the ceo and founder of interneuron so um, we've had a fantastic discussion about all kinds of different things in the space of open source and the, the pros and the cons, and it's been really, really interesting. What would be great now is if maybe we could start with Joel, because obviously the, you know, it'd be, be interesting to hear about it from the interneuron perspective. What's the, the sort of conceptual example that you can give around how this has made a difference to patients or clinicians, or how could it make a difference to patients and clinicians? Yeah, absolutely. So... The, my personal experience of you know working in a hospital uh, is that the, the technology landscape has evolved around the ologies, if you like. So we've got radiology, pathology, uh, histology. Various different departments have budgets. They develop IT systems. Uh, but in, in, caught in between these, you've got the mobile clinician walking between wards, traveling around. Um, and that was often sort of left out. So you would print out your your list or create a paper list and you would annotate this list as you, as you went. So in the, the main use case that Insuneuron solves is for those clinicians, point of care, end of the bed use cases. So things like um, allowing clinicians to take a patient's um, observations, an observation chart, fluid balance from a fluid balance chart, um, drugs off a, off a drug chart. Those are the kinds of things that allow um, a clinician who isn't sat by a computer. So we have a Cloud ready, cloud first, mobile first um, solution that was then co-designed with our NHS customers, so that we had something that met their met NHS standards, but also went through that process of actually being tested and developed in, in, with real use cases, so that uh, we have something that uh, that is is appropriately configurable for for our customers' environments, and really understanding that patient care is best served by a system that supports uh, frontline clinicians. 
Okay. And how did how did you come up with these areas that you wanted to focus on in the first place? In the first, so these these were exactly the problems that I lived. So I, 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 this was my job for, for many years. I was a junior doctor and, you know, the, the hardest thing about being a junior doctor is your organizational skills, it, being able to um, access multiple different systems, to co collate all that information at one point, um, because you have this ward around, you have these moments where all this information needs to be at the right place at the right time so that your clinical right. decision is, is informed. There, there are moments where decisions get made and, all the patient's information is sort of distributed around multiple systems that they, they may be outside the hospital as well as inside the hospital and being able to collate all that information and summarize that in an appropriate way was was pretty much the job um that job is made a lot easier by by the healthcare technology we've developed so you know our, our modular approach allows various different modules to be brought together in one place you can flick through the different modules get the synopsis you need um, you know, and informed decisions in, in, in improve healthcare. Okay, I, I mean, I would agree. Again, I think that there's uh, this is why I like doing this show because sometimes I feel like for some of the people listening, they might assume that that might be the way that it should be working in the first place, but actually isn't. So um, I think it's useful, like you said, sunshine. Sunshine is the best disinfectant, right? Absolutely, and you know, the, um, again, like, you, you, you could cause it. In, innovation is what comes next. We've got a lot of work to do, which is just to, you know, let's call it hygiene. This yeah. is this is the biggest challenge that we have to that we have to face next. Richard, what's your view on that? No, I I, I agree. I mean, you know, Joel said earlier, that even this call, the, the the infrastructure we're using to get this across the you know across the UK, etc. It, it all depends on open source technology. It is already part of everything we do. It, it and and I think that. The, the sort of hygiene factor for me is more about kind of uh, just getting used to the fact that you can you can extend that analogy into healthcare software without it being without it being stigmatized, uh, and and when you do that, when you do that for core kind of components that are in use time and time again in hospitals or or in in, in care settings across the NHS and, and social care, you will reap huge benefits of reuse and and. You know, Joel described a spectrum of licenses and ways that you can approach, uh, you know, issuing the software out there and controlling how, how it gets moved. So it's not about commercial resistance. It's not necessarily the, you know, the CFO is going to disagree because they can't guarantee that they're not going to kind of have somebody else come in and, and take a hold of their software and take it in a different direction. Um, uh, it, 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 I think the, the, the reality is open source software is already here. Uh, and it has benefited almost everything we've built in the NHS for the last 20 years, to be completely frank. Um, and so anybody that tries to say, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure the NHS is ready for that or it doesn't, you know, we don't really support an open source mindset or culture or whatever it might be. I think, you know, I think they're kind of fooling themselves, really. <laughs> well, it feels like the debate, it feels like the terminology is not right. Yeah. At all. In, in a sense of if every product generally has some element of open source in it and what matters is whether or not your product is secure or not. And, you yeah. know, and, and, yeah. we've, and we've created levels of IT security and governance and certification and whether it's DTAC or whatever any of these other things are. So in, in effect, you're, it's really more of a sort of ideological it is. thing it around is. terms that don't really make any sense anymore. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I, and, and I think, you know, if, if you get acceptance of that and that it, that it isn't to be feared, then, then we can realize a lot more benefit of reuse. You know, as an as, as an example, you know, nationally there are lots of big uh, bits of infrastructure that you know software suppliers have to connect to on a regular basis to work and operate in the in the healthcare environment. You know, P, P, spine, it might be something you've heard of, and there are lots of complexities to that. If you if you uh, as we're doing with NHS England at the moment with within the sort of uh, GPIT future space for connected to primary care data, so so allowing uh, you know patients access to their their letters and their results and and appointments etc. If you 
take an open source mindset to that problem. You create an ecosystem of innovation. You, you allow peer review of documentation and architecture decisions and design principles to happen. And you know, it, it just makes everything a lot more transparent. Um, and, and, and maybe that's really the metaphor for a modern day open source is just transparency. Yeah, I, I mean, yes, I, 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 this makes sense to me. So you, your, your, um, Arts Digital, you've done lots of different things within this space or within yeah. IT and healthcare. So, what are some of the examples that you would want to call out of where you've seen real innovation along this line be used in delivering clinical benefit or patient benefit? Oh, honestly, I, I think it's almost easier to try and think of projects where we haven't had a benefit <laughs> or, or, or a kind of a, a head start. You know, we truly are building on, on the shoulders of giants when we talk about open source. Um, I, I think for us, again, we, we talked a little bit about the, the community work we've done with, with Monai. The, the benefit there is that we've standardized for the NHS the contract between machine learning uh, algorithms across the world and said, this is how you're going to interact with the NHS. Uh, use, these, use these open source tools. They're fully transparent. We're not going to lock you in. You're not going to lose your right to innovate and, and do your kind of thing the best way you can. And, and, and we're going to be completely transparent about that. And so for me, that's a, hu like, that's a huge opportunity for the NHS to open its doors and assure others that want to kind of bring their innovations to our, to our NHS that they can do it without risk of, you know, losing what it is that they find most precious, their, their own IP, their own innovation, whatever it might be. Well, that strikes me as a major step forward. It, it is. I mean, you know, we've talked, we've, we've talked, it's, it's relatively new, you know, we've talked about it for a, six months or so as, as we completed the program of work with uh, 9 or 10 trusts across London. And, you know, that there is there is absolutely an appetite to take that elsewhere, not just the rest of the NHS, but again, the, the patterns, the architectural approach, the, the, the ethos behind it should be something that people are thinking about at a strategic level. It can't be a 12 month budget project or, you know, a certain a certain. No, it's uh, not. It's not a closed ended project, is it? Yeah. It's sort of a, it's 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 weaving it into the framework or the foundations of how software development data analysis is all done of course in, in effect yeah absolutely yeah that's a big that's a big that's a big challenge so with with the trusts that you were working with on this monai project was this the first time that they had really tried to interact with these external ai models and, and you've created the pathway for them to do that. Yeah, so, I mean, essentially, you know, we, it, 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 is, it is absolutely at the cutting edge, really. I mean, if you looked at um, computer vision of AI within radiology, looking at x-rays, CT scans, et cetera, and spotting patterns, the, the approach that existed before that was silos. You know, I've got a great innovation, but I need everything top to bottom. I need access to the scan. I need the infrastructure, the specialist GPU. I need to invest in that entire stack top to bottom and build it all again. Um, and, and so for every new innovation and every new model, you end up with these unaffordable, yeah. essentially, frankly, uh, silos of information, IP, hardware. Well, it's also it's unmanageable, right, for the, IP, yeah. for the healthcare system because they don't want 100 different model partners. Of course, and, and, and that's happening in every trust, every radiology department. You know, so it's not even just right. happening once in one organization. It's happening everywhere. So it is quite, you know, it is quite groundbreaking what we're trying to propose as a, as a, as a solution to that. And, and as I talked about, you know, earlier, the alternative is that you don't do that. And I think we all know where that goes, right? I think we all see what other uh, platforms have, have degraded into over time, whether you look at, you know, Uber or, you know, uh, uh, Uber Eats and all the kind of tiering and the, and, the, and the pushing to kind of maximize profitability and, 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 you know, capturing of people. That's not what we want to think about when we think about our data and our NHS and our kind of, you know, future of AI. You can't imagine a hospital that isn't run in some way, shape or form or made more efficient by the technologies we're talking about here not existing in 10 years time. Yeah, I, I could definitely see there's a, there's, there's a, I think there's a really strong argument, which is the hospital itself is incurring costs to generate the data and yeah. we'll continue to do that. And so 
why is it sort of a God-given right of companies to then extract revenue in order to build a model off of that data for them yeah. to generate a profit? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not saying, look, I'm a believer in private enterprise. I really sure, am, yeah. don't get me wrong. And I believe that private enterprise is the solution. If it wasn't, we wouldn't even be here because this wouldn't have happened. AI wouldn't have happened. None of this stuff would have happened. But I do think that there's an element where if you can bring it together, you don't, you, you prevent it. Because I'm worried about a situation where there's, in one radiology department, they have 50 different AI-based providers for, for each type of cancer because each company has their own model, which may well be the best, and be it becomes unwieldy yep. and actually affects patients and clinical care. Whereas if there's a platform where the, the NHS realizes the value of the data that it has, allows people to interact with it in some quasi-democratic way, which still is underpinned by commercial revenue because otherwise no one will yeah. do it, um, that, 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 that then smooths this out from the NHS side and they can just accept back the results somehow. I think that would work really well. Um, yeah. I, I don't see there's much pathway in just adding another company that does another model, add another company that does another model. I, yeah. I, I, I think that's, that's a stretch. Well, I feel like I've done my job, Steve, because that's exactly right. I mean, that's where we're at. You know, we, you know, you talk about what what Answer Digital's done to to kind of make open source and make uh, the NHS kind of sit up and listen. Well, that that's our you know our, our prime example for us, uh, and and it's not the only example. We work across genomics, across digital pathology at the local level, regional level, and national level. So we kind of want to make changes that are the right changes and do things in the right way. You know, you'll see you'll see that through our values, but it, it you know. It, 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 it succinctly, that is a, an excellent demonstration of why the NHS needs to kind of safeguard its own and assure its own access to the best models for the best prices. Makes sense. Um, well, on that note, Richard, Joel, thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, it was great to have you on. As ever, the show will be out on all the podcast channels probably tomorrow. And if you want to catch it on YouTube, it will be out then. And then we will, as I said, cut up some of the best clips and distribute them as well through the next couple of weeks. Um, but both of you, thank you very much for coming on. And Johan, thank you very much for producing the show. Thanks for having us, Steve. Thanks, everyone, Thanks, for listening. Steve. See you again next week.